Jack Nicholson is one of the most recognizable names in all of Hollywood, having starred in such classics as The Shining, As Good As It Gets, and many, many more. But after spending more than half a century in the industry, Jack's name has also become infamous because of both how and where he lived. Recently, Jack's friends have begun expressing their concern for his safety and well-being, considering he's barely been seen in public since 2021. In fact, multiple sources have told media outlets that Jack doesn't leave his house anymore because his mind's slowly slipping away. We'll get into how true or not those rumors might be in a little bit. But first, I'm gonna tell you everything there is to know about Jack Nicholson's Beverly Hills estate. These days, Jack Nicholson spends most of his time living off-grid in the middle of his Mulholland Drive compound, a lavish property that he bought through a series of transactions over a period of decades. As of 2023, Jack's home spans three acres in total, and he bought his first parcel of land way back in 19. 69. Following that initial purchase, Jack would pick up additional lots in 1993 and 2005, the last of which he bought off his friend, the late Marlon Brando, for $5 million. Jack and Marlon used to be neighbors, and to say that they'd get up to a lot of trouble together is probably the understatement of the century. But before I look closer into that relationship, let's take a closer look at Jack's home. The part of the estate that Jack spends the most amount of time in these days is the exact spot where Marlon's home formerly stood. Once Jack purchased that parcel back in the mid 2000s, he had Marlon's old house destroyed because it was covered in black mold. Then he built a new 3,303 square foot structure with four bedrooms and three bathrooms that he's remained in ever since. Of course, Jack doesn't have any social media, which means details and photos of the inside of this home over recent years are hard to come by. But back in the day, Jack's estate was known as Bad Boy Drive on account of the frequent celebrating that went on there. While living next to other notorious party animals like Marlon Brando and Warren Beatty, Jack developed a taste for a crazy lifestyle that involved drinking to excess while experimenting with harder stuff like LSD and cocaine. When it came time to LSD in particular, the memoir Nicholson, Jack's biographer Mark Elliott wrote, Jack's experiences with the drug were life-changing. He believed after taking it the first time, he had seen the face of God. He also had castration fantasies, homoerotic fantasies, and revelations about not not being wanted as an infant. While living in such an expanded state of consciousness, Nicholson's Beverly Hills address became the focal point of hundreds of Hollywood parties, some of which are rumored to have been little more than thinly veiled drug-fueled orgies. On one rare occasion, when Nicholson wasn't in the process of throwing an all-time rager, he invited a photographer from Life magazine to document a few images of him at home. But even in those pictures, Jack has a hard time from refraining from his life of excess. Smoke smoking and drinking while attempting to learn piano, cut film, listen to music, and spend time with his daughter Jennifer. Since last being out in public alongside his son Ray at a Lakers game in 2021, Jack has retired to the interior of this property and seldom stepped outside since, not even to check out his 70-acre compound in Malibu that he still owns to this day. Back in 1977, Jack Nicholson was already at the top of his game, which is why he was able to afford a stunning Malibu estate states that features a tennis court, putting green, a grotto style pool, and so much more. Much like with his home in Beverly Hills, property records suggest that Jack put this estate together piece by piece and taken in total the acreage clocks in at an epic 75 acres. The first two parcels were purchased in July 1977 for an unknown sum. The third and final parcel was then added in January 1990, also for an unknown amount of money. Today, the single-story main structure measures just 2,313 square feet, containing three bedrooms as well as two bathrooms, plus a staff quarters with an additional bathing facility. Reports also suggest that there's a guest house in the premises as well. Shortly after buying the home, Jack and his family transformed the estate into a recreational paradise, complete with a swimming pool, party-sized spa, a fully lit tennis court, miles of private hiking trails, a cabana, and even a putting green jam-packed with a bunch of little red flags. Then in 2011, Jack decided that it might be time to move off this property. He listed the estate for $4.5 million, but ultimately decided to take it off the market, and it's remained under his ownership ever since. While not many details are known about the rest of Jack's real estate portfolio, it's believed to be in the ex 
excess of $100 million with close to a dozen properties in total. For instance, in addition to his Beverly Hills compound, Jack owned a 1,301 square foot house in the Hollywood Hills on Woodrow Wilson Drive that he purchased in 1979 for just $49,000. Of course, it doesn't exist anymore, having burned to the ground during a fire in September 2011. 10 years later, he'd buy a 1,188-square-foot condo on Main Street in the Venice area of Los Angeles for $327,000. It's believed that this home was purchased for a woman he was seeing at the time. His property holdings also extend past Hollywood to the northern reaches of California, where reports suggest that he has a two-acre spread with modest house built on it next to Mount Shasta. Jack's also the very lucky owner of a five-bedroom, three-bathroom home on Kailua on the big island of Hawaii. But the bulk of his real estate holdings outside of LA are confined to the star-studded ski resort town of Aspen, Colorado, where Jack has owned a small condo since 1992 that he purchased for $180,000, as well as a 3,260 square foot house outside of town and a five bedroom, seven bath Victorian mansion that was built in 1890 in the downtown core. Jack offloaded the downtown property in 2016 for $11 million, but still owns the other two. Not that he ever visits them. After all, it was huge news recently when Jack was spotted for the first time in 18 months, being photographed on the balcony of his Mulholland Drive pad. While standing outside his large patio doors that open up into his master bedroom, Jack was seen looking disheveled, wearing a baggy orange t-shirt and some tracksuit pants. One source reportedly told the Daily Mail, he's made it clear his home is his castle, but people just wish he'd come out of the house and pop up, tell them how, or at least to reassure folks he's okay. Some of Jack's friends are even worried that his reclusive nature is becoming more and more like that of his late friend, Marlon Brando. Despite living one of the most colorful lives of all time, Marlon spent his final few years totally alone before dying in 2004. The last time Jack appeared on screen was How Do You Know starring Owen Wilson and Reese Witherspoon, a film that dropped over 10 years ago. Since then, there have been rumors that he's been battling dementia, but in January, one of Jack's friends, Bill Riley, would deny any such claims, suggesting that it was nonsense. After seeing Jack courtside at a Lakers playoff game this past weekend, I'm gonna side with Bill and suggest the rumors of his demise have been exaggerated. That being said, there's no denying that one of the formerly most popular people on the planet is now spending most of his free time alone at home. In some ways, that's simply to be expected. Time catches up with all of us eventually, but when it happens to someone with as much vitality as Jack previously had, it's always noticeable. Here's hoping that Jack Nicholson is healthy and happy, and maybe we'll get lucky enough to be blessed with one last performance. All right, everyone, that's gonna bring this house tour to a close. Thanks for watching today's episode, and before before you head out, consider answering the following question. If you were formerly one of the biggest stars in the world, would you want to spend your final days alone or under the spotlight? Let me know if you'd be as reclusive as Jack has become in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss an episode. My name's Kara, thanks again for watching, and if you wanna keep checking out more homes, don't go anywhere, cause coming right up, I'm about to take you inside the homes of Jerry Springer. I'll see you all next time. Bye. Without a doubt, Jerry Springer was easily one of the most recognizable names in all of talk TV. I mean, after all, how many other hosts can you recall having their name chanted on a regular basis for minutes on end by their studio audience? Jerry might not have bribed his audiences by showering them in gifts like free books and new cars, but that didn't stop his series from briefly beating out even the Oprah Winfrey show in the late 90s as TV's most popular daytime show. The Jerry Springer show started life as a political commentary program back in 1991, but it would soon shift its focus to tabloid news in the mid 90s to turn itself into a ratings juggernaut. Over the next 27 years, Jerry would become the king of shock TV. And when Whenever he needed to escape the madness of enraged ex-lovers, flying chairs, or other dangerous projectiles, Jerry made his way back home to his residence in Sarasota on Florida's Bird Key Island. For those who never heard of it before, Bird Key is a man-made island that was created back in the 1950s by founding father Arthur Vining Davis. 
Arthur was the CEO of Alcoa, the world's eighth largest producer of aluminum. Jerry's home on the island is located in the west, boasting a reported four bedrooms, five bathrooms, as well as just over 6,000 square feet of space. He purchased this very salmon colored home back in 1987 for just $375,000. And since then it's increased in value to an estimated worth of $4.6 million. Unfortunately, Jerry has maintained a wall of strict privacy when it comes to his home life and he's never shared any images of the inside. Instead, all we really know for sure are the amenities included around the property, like its full dock with a private boat. Even with all that water surrounding Jerry's home, he maintained a large swimming pool in the premises that took up the majority of the backyard. Meanwhile, there's also a gigantic deck that provides ample space to spread out under the Florida sun or to enjoy those wonderful views of the water. And while we might not know all that much about Jerry's home here in Sarasota, we know quite a bit more about about his love for the city. Jerry Springer decided to move his home base from Cincinnati, Ohio to Sarasota, Florida in 1997. Interestingly enough, Jerry almost didn't move to Sarasota at all. During a 2012 interview with The Observer, he revealed that Sarasota was actually his third choice of ideal living spots. But after determining that California would be too far of a commute and that South Carolina was simply too cold, Springer decided to set down roots in Florida. From that point on, he immediately fell in love with the state's sparkling shorelines. In fact, it was Jerry's ex-wife Mickey Velton that discovered Sarasota in the first place. At the time, he and Mickey had been looking to live on the water, so Mickey traveled to Florida and spent a day or two just driving around. When she arrived in Sarasota, she was captured by its beauty and picked out a series of 10 different houses. Shortly after, Jerry flew down to check them all out. The 10th and final house would turn out to be the one they both loved it so much, they decided it would become their primary residence. Soon after, the people of Sarasota began to take notice of their famous new neighbor. Always maintain Jerry's privacy with the necessary level of respect. Sometimes when he and Vicky were enjoying a meal at St. Armand Circle Shopping District, there might be a tourist or two who wanted to take a picture. But for the most part, Jerry could be home in Sarasota and not have to worry about being bothered. Now you might be wondering, considering every episode of his series around this time was shot in the state of Connecticut, how did his home in Sarasota Sarasota become his primary address. Well, it definitely helps that Jerry owned his own private plane that he used each Sunday to commute to Connecticut. He then spent two days shooting an entire week's worth of episodes only to hop on his plane and fly back. For the rest of the week, Jerry would enjoy his time off by walking around Lido Beach while eating out at a ton of local restaurants, such as Cafe Amici or State Street. But as special as Jerry's relationship was with Sarasota, it wouldn't be where he spent his final few days on Earth. Those moments were reserved for Chicago, Illinois. During the second season of The Jerry Springer Show in 1992, the series moved from Cincinnati to Chicago. Jerry continued to live in Cincinnati, but would commute to Chicago daily to film the series. When the show first arrived in Chi Town, it was still a political series conducting serious discussions with various panels, but that would soon change in a way that many citizens of Chicago didn't appreciate. Weighed down by low ratings, The Jerry Springer Show underwent a metamorphosis during this period, turning the series into a never-ending parade of individuals who belonged to hate groups, had strange fetishes, were being cheated on by their partners, or were simply brawling uncontrollably with family members. It was more like theater than it was a talk show, and it was also wildly successful, featuring such weird episode titles like I'm Pregnant by a Transsexual, I Slept with Your Husband and Son, Livid Lesbians, and My Grandpa is a but once the series has evolved into this new structure, mainstream Chicago figures became mortified that Springer was making a reputation for himself in their city. When Springer showed up on the cover of Rolling Stone, local reverend Michael Flager launched a protest against his show. Then in 1997, Channel 5 anchors Carol Marin and Ron Majors resigned over concerns about the direction of the news operation after Springer was hired to provide commentaries for the 10 p.m. time slots. Springer delivered two commentaries and then quit. Two years later, the Chicago City Council called Jerry for hearings to determine if his show could be required to get an entertainment license. Eventually, in 2009, the Jerry Springer Show deserted Chicago to film in Stamford, Connecticut. That's when Jerry began his decades-long commute from Florida to Connecticut each week. Somewhat surprisingly, Jerry announced his retirement from entertainment a few months ago in late 2022, stating at the time he wanted to try enjoying retirement 
retirement while he was still healthy. He explained in a statement released to the media at the time, I'm 78 and have been in front of the camera now for 40 years, plus 10 years in politics. I'm winding down. In particular, Jerry was looking forward to spending time with his 13-year-old grandson who lives in Chicago with Springer's daughter Katie and her husband Richard. With his daughter still living in Illinois, Jerry actually owned a home of his own in the state, and while we know next to nothing about it, it would become the very spot where he spent his final few moments on this earth. Word came down on Thursday, April 27th that Jerry had passed away in the comfort of his Chicago home. Family spokesperson Gene Galvin would release a statement after his death, reading in parts, Jerry's ability to connect with people was at the heart of his success in everything he tried. Whether that was politics, broadcasting, or just joking with people on the street who wanted a photo or a word. He's irreplaceable and his loss hurts immensely, but memories of his intellect, heart, and humor will live on. So while Sarasota might have been where Jerry's heart was, Chicago will be where his body remains at least for the time being. It's unclear where he'll be buried, but it will no doubt be somewhere that came to mean a lot to him over the course of his life. For now, that'll bring this latest house tour to a close. Thanks so much for watching, and before you leave, consider answering the following question. Would you be willing to commute by flying to a different state each week for work? Let me know if you would have kept that up for decades like Jerry did in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss an episode. My name's Kara, thanks again for watching, and and I'd like to send my best wishes out to Jerry's family. We're all thinking about you right now.